You're listening to the Catholic Fragments Podcast, where we explore the treasures of Catholicism, the fullness of truth revealed in Jesus Christ and His Church. I'm your host, Dr. Donald Wallenfang, and I invite you to join me in gathering up the fragments of the truth that sets us free. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A reading from Psalm 16. I bless the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart exhorts me. I keep the Lord always before me. With him at my right hand I shall never be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, my soul rejoices, my body also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor let your devout one see the pit. You will show me the path of life, abounding joy in your presence, the delights at your right hand forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. St. John of the Cross, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome everyone to this episode of the Catholic Fragments Podcast. I'm Dr. Donald Wallenfang, and what a delight to plunge into the heart of the writings of St. John of the Cross, this time within the early part of his commentary called The Spiritual Canticle. Most people think of St. John of the Cross in relation to his famous concept of the dark night, the dark night of the soul, but this is a different one of his works that is based on the Song of Songs in Scripture. And we're going to look at two specific fragments of this text called the Spiritual Canticle that will give us deep insight into the meaning of the divine presence, what is meant by the presence of God in relation to the soul. Also, what is meant by divine love in terms of God's presence living in the soul. And finally, the meaningfulness and necessity of death. So let's continue to learn from this master, St. John of the Cross, this master of the soul and the spiritual life. As with all the major writings of St. John of the Cross, the spiritual canticle is his commentary on his own original poem that goes by the same name, The Spiritual Canticle. So St. John of the Cross writes all these extensive commentaries on most often just a couple of stanzas, the beginning stanzas from his poetry. So The Dark Night is based on the poem The Dark Night, The Ascent of Mount Carmel, and also The Living Flame of Love. So St. John of the Cross begins his theology, you could say, with poetry, and continues it by commenting on his own poems that are inspired by biblical poetry. This poem, called The Spiritual Canticle, lyrically expresses the loving dialogue between the soul and its spiritual spouse, Christ the Bridegroom. St. John's poem and commentary allow us to peer modestly into the intimate relationship that he enjoyed with Jesus in the hidden recesses of his soul. And St. John composed this poem while he was imprisoned in the monastery prison in Toledo by fellow Carmelite monks who were upset that he and St. Teresa of Avila were starting a reformed order of the Carmelites called the Discalced Carmelites. So he was taken in custody by them and kept in a very small prison cell and suffered much over the course of about a year. It was here that he composed so many of these poems in his heart. 
This one, the spiritual canticle, again is based on the Hebrew poetry of the Song of Songs in Scripture. And many saints throughout the history of the church have allegorized the Song of Songs in depicting the relationship between the human soul and God. So they're taking what is erotic love poetry between husband and wife and applying it to the spirituality of the spiritual soul and God who is spirit by way of analogy we say so allegory is an important sense of scripture that all of the church fathers talk about and it's very common for theologians throughout the centuries of the church to modulate into an allegorical reading of scripture so saint john of the cross in this prison it was only because a sympathetic guard provided him with some writing materials that St. John was able to inscribe his poetic imagination onto the written page and then later write these expansive commentaries on his own poetry. For this episode of the Catholic Fragments podcast, we will focus only on the 11th stanza of the poem and St. John's commentary on it. He begins his commentary with reference to the wise man uh, who wrote the book of Proverbs, according to some strands of tradition, King Solomon, at least contributing to some of this book. But St. John says that the wise man says of Christ the bridegroom that the soul who seeks him as money will find him. And to quote from the book of Proverbs, chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, If you seek wisdom, divine wisdom, like silver, and like hidden treasures, search her out, then you will understand the fear of the Lord, the knowledge of God you will find. I think it's a provocative statement St. John makes with reference to this two verses in the book of Proverbs. If the soul seeks God like money, she will find him. How do we seek money in this life? Money is so attractive, isn't it? And yet, it is one of the most unreal things in our experience. The soul that seeks God like we tend to seek money will surely find him. If we think about that for a minute, how do I seek money? Can I apply that same yearning to God? Oh, how I would love so much more money. More thousands of dollars, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. Oh, how I would love more and more money. Wouldn't that be great? I wouldn't feel like I'm struggling so much to pay for this or that. I wouldn't feel like I'm restricted in my travels, in my shopping and buying and enjoying all the good things of life. Oh, if I only had more money. But if I apply that desire to God, the beauty is that God is right there giving his whole self to my soul. I have only to receive. I have to seek him, to find him, but then receive. God is not elusive to the human being like money. God does not run out like money. God does not disappoint like money. God does not corrupt like money. If the soul seeks God, like we tend to seek money, we definitely will find God. So let's read this stanza 11 first in Spanish, the Spanish original, to hear the poetic sound of it and meter and rhythm. And then I'll read it in English, the English translation, and then just feature a couple of St. John's parts of his commentary on this stanza 11. The whole poem, The Spiritual Canticle, has a total of 40 stanzas, which is quite long. But this is toward the beginning of it, stanza 11. Here's how the Spanish goes. Descubre tu presencia y mateme tu vista y hermosura 
mira que la dolencia de amor que no se cura, sino con la presencia y la figura. So that's the Spanish of this stanza. Then the English, reveal your presence and may the vision of your beauty, hermosura, be my death. For the sickness of love, amor, the sickness of love is not cured except by your very presence and image. Con la presencia y la figura. Reveal your presence and may the vision of your beauty be my death. For the sickness of love is not cured except by your very presence and image. It is so rich and for the contemplative soul, it's, it's a launching pad right here. <laughs> Reveal your presence. This prayer to God. Reveal your presence. Reveal your presence to me. Reveal your presence to us. And may the vision of your beauty. Your beauty, O oh God. I seek what is beautiful in this life. But the beautiful beauty itself is God. May the vision of your beauty, O oh God, be my death. Because death allows me to take it in all the more to take in the presence of God all the more for my soul to be expanded to its utmost capacity to be actualized fully I must die I must die a thousand deaths in this life and I must eventually die a biological death in order to enter the resurrected life completely and St. John also references this sickness of love, la dolencia de amor, a sickness of love, which is, is not good. He's saying this needs to be cured. And what he means, we'll see, by a sickness of love is a lack of love. Love gone missing in the heart. But it's cured by God's presence and image that floods into the soul. So now let's look at St. John's commentary on this stanza 11, just part of his commentary. Again, which he begins by saying, if you seek God like you seek money, you surely will find him. You will not be disappointed. But what he's aiming for here is what he calls the glorious vision of the divine essence, the divine substance. And this is a truth about the meaning of life, about being a creature in relation to God, that God alone satisfies, that what our heart yearns for in terms of truth and goodness and beauty, we find completely in God. We are fully satisfied by the saturation of divine truth, goodness and beauty, divine presence, the divine essence. Substance. So it's metaphysical language talking about the being of God. What my soul longs for is the being of God. Not anything that sin would pretend to satisfy. No sin satisfies, and that's why it's sin. Sin pursues what is not real. As we said in a previous podcast episode referring to the work of Dionysius, evil is what is not real. But God is the really, really real. The real itself, the standard of reality. St. Augustine says that in this, un this universe is filled with signa, signs, that all point to the one singular res, where we get in English the word reality. The res is God. St. John of the Cross in this commentary talks about three different kinds of divine presence in relation to the soul. So there's a lot of nuance here. When we say divine presence, we don't necessarily mean only one thing. The first is his presence by essence, St. John says. In this way, God is present not only in the holiest souls, but also in sinners and all other creatures. With this presence, he gives them life and being. 
Should this essential presence be lacking to them, they would all be annihilated. Thus, this presence is never wanting to the soul. So, this is the necessary presence of God that makes a being be, and makes a living being be alive on top of that, and makes a rational being rational. Without this presence of God, in terms of the this essence of God that upholds our being and upholds every being, we would not be. So this is, is a definite presence that doesn't fluctuate as long as we exist. Second is God's presence by grace in which he abides in the soul. Abides in the soul. Jesus uses this language, meno in Greek. Abiding in the soul, pleased and satisfied with it. Now, all have this presence of God. Those who fall into mortal sin lose it. The soul cannot know naturally if it has this presence. It can't know by nature alone that it would have this presence. But it comes especially by way of sacrament, baptism, first of all, where we are introduced, or better, where the grace of God is introduced in the soul, frees us from the shackles of original sin, and adopts us as a child of God. The beginning of our redemption, this baptismal grace, this purifying grace, and this is a presence of God. And it is, above all, the third person of the Most Holy Trinity, God, the Holy Spirit. So when we read the Catechism of the Catholic Church about the meaning of grace, it gives us something like half a dozen meanings of the word grace, but the most precise and definite is we're talking about the gift of God who is God, the very love between God the Father and God the Son. What tradition calls vinculum amoris, the bond of love. God the Holy Spirit is what we mean by grace that flows through the sacraments. Then the third is the divine presence by way of spiritual affection, St. John says. For God usually grants his spiritual presence to devout souls in many ways, by which he refreshes, delights, and gladdens them. So this presence seems to have a bit more subjective recognition and quality to it in terms of affection, that the soul would feel something here that the soul would swoon because the divine presence is moving in the soul, is lifting the soul. And this is where we would talk about mystical experiences of ecstasy and transport and rapture and things like this because of a very profound, clear, spiritual affection of God moving, circulating in the soul. St. John goes on to say, Yet these many kinds of spiritual presence, just as the others, are all hidden. For in them God does not reveal himself as he is, since the conditions of this life will not allow such a manifestation. Thus, this above verse of the stanza 11, the first verse, reveal your presence, could be understood of any of these three ways in which God is present. So this, I think, is very helpful to think about the presence of God. It is what each one of our souls longs for. We actually don't really want money. We don't want a surplus of material goods. We don't want all the beautiful views our eyes can take in in this world. We don't want all the pleasures of the flesh. We don't want all the honors that the world could give in a very secular way, or even in a religious way. We don't want all of these pleasures that don't keep their promises. We want God. We want the perfect love of God and the glory of God, St. John says. This is what we long for. We have to be careful not to let ourselves be sidetracked by all of these idols. And then St. John talks about death, this happy death that grants us 
this full union with God, once perfectly purified, of course. He says, further in his commentary, in this law of grace, after the time of the resurrected Christ, the soul can see God when separated from the body. The desire to live but a short while and die in order to see him is more perfect. Not a suicidal movement or something, but to desire to depart from this life, to see God, what's called the beatific vision also, this perfection of being divinized, being fully united to the divine essence. The soul is good to desire that. St. Paul says this in his letter to the Philippians. I long to depart from this world and be united with Christ for that is far better. But if God wants me to remain here and be involved in fruitful witnessing and evangelization, I'm happy to do so. And he says, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Back to St. John's commentary. True love receives all things that come from the beloved. Prosperity, adversity, even chastisement. With the same evenness of soul, since they are his will. And they afford her joy and delight because... St. John the Evangelist says, perfect charity casts out all fear. From his first epistle, chapter 4. Death cannot be bitter, St. John of the Cross says. Death cannot be bitter to the soul that loves. For in it she finds all the sweetness and delight of love. Death gives to the soul all the sweetness and delight of love. The soul that does not die in mortal sin. The thought of death cannot sadden her. For what she finds is that gladness accompanies this thought. Neither can the thought of death be burdensome and painful to her. For death will put an end to all her sorrows and afflictions and be the beginning of all her bliss. She thinks of death as her friend and bridegroom. And at the thought of it, she rejoices as she would over the thought of her betrothal and marriage. And she longs for the day and the hour of her death more than earthly kings long for kingdoms and principalities. Wow. Oh my goodness. He speaks the truth. He speaks the truth. The soul that is convinced that God is all the soul desires, then can't wait to die and be united to God and not have to deal with all of the various temptations, distractions, disturbances in this earthly life, in this fallen world, though being redeemed by God gradually, but still the signs of fallenness are everywhere. Concupiscence lashes out of the souls of human beings regularly and even within our own. So this longing to die so as to be enveloped and filled with divine love that is beyond the capacities of this life. So then St. John goes back to quoting the wise man, this time the author of Ecclesiasticus, the book of Sirach, Proclaiming this kind of death. O death, your sentence is welcome to the person who feels need. Wow. If it is welcome to those who feel need for earthly things, even though it does not provide for these needs, but rather despoils such persons of the possessions they have, how much better will its sentence be for the soul in need of love? As this is one who is crying out for more love. For death will not despoil her of the love she possesses, but rather will be the cause of love's completeness, what she desires, and the satisfaction of all her needs. Are you a needy soul? So am I. We need love. We yearn for love. We want to belong. We want true community. We don't want to worry about 
anything. We, won't, we don't want to worry about things destructive happening to us or around us. We don't want any more contradictions of love that this earthly life experiences way too often. We want the real thing. We want love in spirit and flesh. This love of God that became flesh for our salvation. St. John goes on to say, The soul is right in daring to say, May the vision of your beauty be my death. So this is going on in that stanza 11. May the vision of your beauty be my death, since she knows that at the instant she sees this beauty, she will be carried away by it, and absorbed in this very beauty, and transformed in this beauty, and made beautiful like this beauty itself, and enriched and provided for like this very beauty. David declares, consequently, that the death of the saints is precious in the sight of the Lord. Psalm 116, verse 15. This would not be true if they did not participate in God's own grandeurs, for in the sight of God nothing is precious but what he in himself is. So God makes the soul beautiful, and the soul that longs for the beauty of God is becoming all the more beautiful through this via pucritudinis, this way of beauty, that is the way to God. Finally, accordingly, the soul does not fear death when she loves, rather she desires it. Yet, he says, sinners are always fearful of death. They foresee that death will take everything away and bring them all evils. Again, but the one who loves God, who seeks God with all his or her heart, soul, mind, strength, is not afraid of death. St. John says that it should be known that love never reaches perfection until the lovers are so alike that one is transfigured in the other, and then the love is in full health. Wow, so this podcast episode, we're talking about the presence of God, the love of God, and finally, happy death that leads us into the full consummation of our relationship with God, the spiritual marriage, that we can, if God grants it, have a foretaste in this life. It will be in mystical experience, for sure. But ultimately, death is necessary to lead us into the fullness of the presence of God. This word presence... In English, from the Latin, pre, esse, which means to be before the other, to be there, to be in front of, to be at hand, to be there at heart, to be there at home together. And from the Greek, parousia, parousia, para enai, to be beside or alongside the other. So this is a Greek, we're talking about the second coming of Christ, the parousia, when God will be all in all, and it's referring to the inbreaking presence of God, Emmanuel, God with us forever, everlasting. So may we seek the fullness of the divine presence with all our hearts, hunting for the hidden manna within the expansive dwelling places that make up the interior castles of our souls. And may we not be afraid of death since it is the necessary bridge that brings us to perfect union with the personal presence of the Most Holy Trinity. Thank you for joining me on the Catholic Fragments podcast, where you are equipped to think toward the whole, to pray from the heart, and to live as a witness 